apresentando Service Design Thinking, How to Successfully Innovate Beyond Buzzwords, Mark Stickdorn. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Bom dia. Como estão? But that's it. Sorry. <laughs> Let me see if this works. Perfect. Isn't that great? We're on time. As a German, that is... Wow. Yesterday, it, um, it hurt a little bit for me, being German. But I really like how you uh, take that. It's really, really easy going. I really, really like that. I have to say sorry to a few people here, because um, on Wednesday, I was supposed to give a workshop. And unfortunately, I was sick, so I couldn't do that. Um, luckily, there was Arne who took over my participants, and I think you had a great workshop. Was it good? Probably better than mine anyway, so that's, that's all fine. So I will be talking today about service design thinking, and I titled this talk, How to Successfully Innovate Beyond Buzzwords. And that is a clear misfit, right? Because there are three buzzwords up there. There's service design, there's design thinking, and now even service design thinking becomes a buzzword. And I want to make something clear in the beginning. I don't care how you call what we are doing. I don't care how you call, if you call it service design or design thinking, if you call it end-to-end -end user experience or customer experience design. Disney calls it imagineering. And I don't care how you call it. I think it's important what we do, that we agree on a way how we work on a certain tool set, and that we just do good work with that. So I don't care about buzzwords. I call it service design, but please exchange this word for whatever you think is appropriate for that. There was a great, uh, great intro from Felipe, although I didn't understand what he was saying about me. So I just want to tell you one thing about me. I'm living in two worlds. Well, probably I live in even more worlds, but right here I live in two worlds. I have my academic world, so I'm a researcher, I'm a lecturer, I supervise theses and stuff like that. And on the other hand, I'm a practitioner. I help organizations to do service design, and I have two companies. And my aim is to somehow combine that. And this will be also my aim at the end of the talk to show you how I am doing that. But before I start talking about service design, I would like to take you on a journey. By the way, who of you knows about service design? Can you show me some hands? All right, who is working in the field of service design, or whatever you call that? Uh, not that many. Two, three, okay, interesting. So before I talk about service design, I would like to take you on a customer journey. So we slip into the shoes of a customer, we use a persona for that, a tool we are all familiar with, and we follow this persona throughout a customer journey. We slip into the shoes of a customer. And I would like to start with that to show you the complexity and the scale of customer journeys I'm working with. This is our persona. It's Jacob, 20-year-old designer from Germany. And we follow him on a service we're all familiar with, with a holiday. Most of us traveled here to receive him. So I think we can all relate to what's going to happen now. So please think about the journey I'm going to show you now. And remember if that more or less was your journey to come here or for your last holiday as well. It might have started, in this case it started, with reading a travel magazine. Then he went to a travel agency to get more information about a certain destination he was interested in. He went online and read online reviews. Does this sound familiar to you? Who of you is using... Can we have some light in the audience, maybe? Because I would like to ask a few questions. Just show me some hands. Who of you is using services like TripAdvisor, Booking.com, Hotels.com, whatever, to read online reviews? Just so show me some hands. Now take a look around the audience. Take a look. You see how many hands are up there? Why is that? 
Do you believe still in advertisements? Do you believe these glossy brochures where the hotel is right next at the beach? Or do you believe what people tell you in social media about that? Online reviews. This is a real game changer. Coming back to that later. Nowadays, we book online. We go to a travel agency, but actually book online. It's interesting. And then there's another touch point. We're dreaming of the holiday. Very important. It is. We're getting pictures in our minds. So Dave said uh, yesterday, it's also important what is in between. Same is true for customer journey. It is a very important touch point. Suddenly the day has come, we pack our bags, and we go to the airport. We arrive at a long queue. All of this happened in the so-called pre-service period. We haven't even encountered any real service touch point. Everything until now was just about expectations. So after standing in queue and waiting, we finally can check in. And then there comes this nice touch point of the security check, so the holiday where we want to relax, start with take off your shoes, take out your laptop, do you have liquids in there? Come on, hurry up, hurry up. Really relaxing, eh? It's perfect. So I'm going to speed that up now a little bit, just to give you an idea of all this. And this is a really high-level customer journey. We bought the plane, we have some in-flight experiences, we get some meals there, we arrive at a destination, we have to go to our hotel, we stay at the hotel. If you remember what Arne said yesterday about what is design thinking, design thinking is about zooming in and zooming out. We zoomed out now. This is a really big picture. You can zoom into this touch point, into staying at the hotel, and have a whole customer journey for that. Then can zoom in further to how you get greeted in the hotel, or how you check out of the hotel, and take a look at that in detail as well. We, well, in that case, Jacob attended a, a diving school. We attend a conference here. We go out for dinner, of course, we fly back home, and then the post-service period starts when we go online and post our reviews. This is one customer journey, just an overview of that. And you can illustrate that as a kind of movie. So a movie consists out of a sequence of scenes. A customer journey consists out of a sequence of touch points. You can visualize that using tools we know from theater and movies, like a storyboard, for example. If you want to get an overview, you can also take a look at which stages you have. In this very simple example, we have the stage pre-service, service, post-service post period. But this was just the customer journey of one persona, of Jacob. Let's take a look at another one, at Klaus, and see how both relate to each other. I'm not going to go through in detail, just show you where they connect. That's where they connect. When Jacob comes back home, he posted photos on Facebook, maybe on Twitter, maybe on Instagram. He talks with his friends about that. He posts reviews in online forums like TripAdvisor, Booking.com, and so on. And this affects other people in their pre-service periods. So there is a strong connection, actually, between different customers. And this is all due to social media. Well, I would like to show you a few examples of how social media can affect a customer journey positively and how it can affect it negatively. Let's start with a positive one. So what is social media? Nowadays, we can reach with our opinions millions of people, not only our friends and family. And this phenomenon is not new. If you think of how you booked your holidays like 20 years ago, you ask your friends and family. It's always the source number one. Source number two are different reviews. And far after that comes just advertisement and other corporate communications. What's different now with social media is suddenly you can reach a lot of people. 
So here's an example of positive social media from the field of tourism. This is Joshi. Joshi is a stuffed giraffe. It's a teddy bear, you could say. And here's a story about Joshi. There was a family in a hotel, and the kid forgot Joshi. And the dad didn't know what to do, because the kid couldn't sleep without Joshi. So the dad told the kid a story. He said, well, Joshi was so relaxed in this hotel. He likes it so much. He just stayed there a few more days, and he will join us later again. So he called the hotel and asked them, look, have you found Joshi, this stuffed giraffe? I said, yes. Can you send it to me? And they said, yes, no problem. And this is what you would expect from a good hotel to do. Well, that's not only what they did. Joshi went to the pool. They did a whole photo story of Joshi's longer stay in the hotel. They printed out the photos and put it in a box and sent it together with Joshi to the dad. A few examples. <laughs> I love the spa treatment. <laughs> Isn't that great, with cucumber on it? So Joshi not only had a great stay there, he also made friends there, like there. And actually, he started working there. And which job you would give Joshi? Of course, he became responsible for loss prevention. Of course, this was a big surprise. And, well, the dad wrote a story, and you can read the whole story, there's a link on Huffington Post. And of course, this goes viral. What do you think about this hotel brand? I'm not related to this brand anyway, like, no advertisement. Um, what happens, of course, is you create a great image. Well, this can go wrong as well. And this is when social media turns negative. And I'm sure many of you know this example I'm going to show you, because it is, for me, the classic example of negative social media. Who of you knows the story of Dave Carroll and United Brakes Guitars? Can you show me a few hands? Oh, not that many. Interesting. So we're going to listen to a bit of music now. So here's the story. Dave Carroll is a Canadian singer-songwriter. And he was on a flight when he saw suddenly that people outside were throwing guitars. And his guitar, the singer-songwriter, it's a very precious object, of course, fall to the ground. The guitar was broken, he tried to complain to get his money back, and they just said no. So he, this story went on and on, and he tried really hard, but it didn't work. So he did what a singer-songwriter can do, he wrote a song about that and put it on YouTube. i just show you, whoop, wrong one, maybe the first minute or so. Do we have sound here? There should be some sound. Music without sound is boring. <laughs> All good here. Do we have some sound? Ah! That's fine. Catchy tunes, eh? It's, it's quite an old story. It's already three years old, but I think it really shows the power of social media. It is just 
a complaint letter on United, but he sung it. So when he didn't get further with the complaint, he just told them, well, I'm going to do that, what a singer-songwriter can do. I'm going to write three songs about United and how you broke my guitar. I'm going to put it on YouTube. And within one year, I will get one million clicks. So they said, yeah, whatever, do whatever you like. We don't care. What do you think? What was the budget of this video? Just throw in some numbers. How much money did he spend on the video? How much? 100, exactly, jackpot. You're going to get beer tonight. <laughs> it was $100. The whole video was just made with a few friends. Well, he put it on YouTube, he went to bed, and next morning, suddenly CNN called him. And it was all over the news. After one week, it had three million clicks. After one week, if you go now on it, it has 13 million clicks. Harvard Business Review wrote a case study about that. It affected the stock price of United. So you could really see that it made a difference. And this is just because one customer had a bad experience. So it all comes down to, at the end of the day, to what we just heard, customer satisfaction. And what is customer satisfaction? They are very basic models, which go back to Carnot or Oliver. It is the comparison of your expectations with your true experiences. If these match, maybe I should step in the light so you can see me. If these match, we're satisfied. If you promise too much and don't hold up to that, you're dissatisfied. If you exceed your expectations, you're even delighted. So if you have this model in mind, and think again of the customer journey we just saw, you can see this model there. Everything that happens in the pre-service period affects your expectations. Even touch points which are not directly related to a brand, like you're standing in front of a photocopy machine and dreaming of your holiday. You're dreaming of it, so you build certain expectations. And then during the service period, you have certain experiences, and you match that. In the, pre in the post service period, you're going to post, depending on if you were satisfied or not. This is the review we see. Well, how can we affect that? It's great if they match, of course. But what happens often is we promise too much, and we don't keep up with that. Think about advertisements. What do we promise people, and what do you get? Mostly there's a big misfit. So the other option to create dissatisfaction is if you decrease the experience. Think about cost cuts. Where do you save money first? And what does it affect? It affects experiences. So again, you will have dissatisfied customers. On the other hand, you can also create satisfied customers. Of course, you can increase the experiences. And if I tell that to any company, they said, yes, but this will cost us millions. Doesn't. Believe me, I'm going to show you a few examples later. The last thing you can do is you can decrease expectations. And this is something very natural, something we all do. Think about when you invite friends for dinner, what do you tell them? Well, I don't expect too much, you know, I'm just going to do some cheese, like it's just a very simple dinner. Then you went shopping and stand like for hours in the kitchen to just surprise them. Like, look at that. Minimize your expectations to maximize your satisfaction. Brands do the same. Think about the user interface, the website of low cost carriers. Think about Ryanair website in particular. It's the most crappy website I ever saw. My expectation is zero. But still, I get from A to B, so that's fine. It works. But as Dana just said, it's not that easy. Because if you really think of the whole experience, we also have to measure the satisfaction of the whole experience. And that means we have to understand the satisfaction, the context of each touchpoint. And this is changing over the time. 
So now think about how we measure satisfaction, as Dana said. How do we do that? Lou had some great examples of that yesterday. We do surveys. We do things like net promoter score. Put it somewhere in the journey. The questionnaire is mostly somewhere at the end. That's the moment when you ask for satisfaction. What you, in fact, get is the satisfaction of this particular touch point, nothing else. Think about net promoter score, which is often asked after you purchase something. It's somewhere here. So you get only uh, a result for this touch point. And you get it only for a certain customer. Other customer journeys look different. Also, they have a certain emotional journey, as we call it. And if you think about satisfaction rates and average satisfaction rates, what do you learn from a touch point? And you say, well, on average, people are more or less satisfied here. Not much, because you're missing the context. Even worse is, who do you ask? Because you might lose customer very early in the customer journey. So if you ask later on, you don't get them. You don't get results from them. So this is a problem we have. It's not a problem that we have enough data. We're living in times of big data. What we're missing is thick data, is context of the data, is to make sense of this data. And I'm going to show you later how we do this. So my statement is that marketing is right now shifting from advertisements to meaningful customer experiences. And this is a big chance for us, for all of us, because they need us. They need us to design great services, no matter if it's online or offline, with the aim to create great customer experiences. And for me, this is the reason why we need service design. So now I want to talk a little bit about service design. And I'd like to split that. First, I'd like to talk about service. Then I like to talk about design. What is service for me? Very briefly, I would like to introduce a marketing concept by Vargo and Lush called the service dominant logic. And I do this very simple by one example. This should be an answering machine. You know, this little box you used to put next to the telephone and if someone calls and you're not there, the box answers and actually records the answer. What do you think? Is this a product or is this a service? Just show me some hands. Who is for product? Don't be shy. There's no right or wrong. All right. Who's for service? Interesting. It's a box, you know? It's a box you put next to a telephone. Hmm. What about that? Voicemail on your phone. Is this a product or is this a service? Does it really matter for you? Is it important for you as a customer? Is the customer experience really different if you click a button here or if you click a button on your phone? It doesn't really matter. It's actually that product serves you the right, the, the, actually the product serves you so you have to understand the service behind the product. And this is exactly what service dominant logic is about. They claim that we used to live in a goods dominant logic, where we built products and we sold them. And it was an exchange of money against goods. So the customer journey looked like this. We have loads of advertisements until someone finally makes a decision and buys a product. By the way, also for products, reading online reviews is the most important decision factor nowadays. Then we buy the product, so all the advertisement is focusing on the moment of sale. Whatever comes afterwards, it's like after sales. It's only when the customer has a problem then they will contact you as a brand again. It's a very short customer journey. Service dominant logic, on the other hand, is the value in use. So only pay when you use something. 
There are many examples for business models like that. In a B2B context, it could be Rolls-Royce, one of the largest uh, manufacturer of airline engines. They used to sell the engines, but now they rent the engines. And they call it power by the hour. So only if the engine actually runs, they get money. B2C could be software as a service, like Adobe and all that. So you only pay for that month when you use that software, instead of shipping giant floppy disks, as we heard yesterday. What it comes down to is what we call value co-creation. So we co-create value, the customer together with the company. And if you compare these two customer journeys, the one of a product-based and the one of a service-based, you see a big difference. Because actually, if you understand a product as a service, you focus on the use of that product. Who of you actually uses all the buttons of your remote control of your TV? It's a remote control with hundreds of buttons. Which one do you really use? Which one do you really care about? Do they really care about the value in use? Or do they care about how many stickers they can put on a box to actually sell that? I tried to find a TV which is easy to use. And I went online, read all the reviews. It was all about technical stuff. I went to a shop and asked, well, which of these TVs are really easy to install and really easy to use? And the guy was just laughing and said, well, they're all a pain in the ass, but this one got a better picture. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care if they have a pixel more or less. I don't see that. What I care is about the customer experience. If you understand a product as a service, you understand the whole customer journey. And suddenly, you have a long-term relationship with your customer. Just a few quotes to show you that it's not some wild academic thinking, but actually, it is practice. Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, when he introduced the Kindle Fire, he stood on stage and said, we didn't think of it as a product, as a tablet. We thought of it as a service. I'm sure all of you, oh, can, we, can we have once more a little bit more light? I'd like to ask a question. Who of you used to own a Nokia phone? You remember Nokia? Can you, can you, who used to have one, actually used it? Can you show some hands? I had one, don't be shy. All right, they were great products, right? They were really durable. I mean, you could smash it to the ground and you can pick it up and it still worked. It was beautiful. Try that with an iPhone. Like, we have to cover it up so it doesn't break. It's, Interesting. Um, who of you is using now a smartphone? What kind? Apple, Android, whatever. Interesting. Why did you stop using Nokia? Who is still using a Nokia phone? <laughs> One, two, three. Okay, got it. <laughs> yes, yes, please. Round of applause for you. There we go. We, we even have a proud Nokia user out there. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. <laughs> Why do we use smartphone? Is it because the product is so good? Is it because it's so durable? Why do we use it? What do you use your phone for most? Just think in percentages. How often do you actually use it to call someone? How often do you use it to text someone? How often do you take photos? Take videos? Hmm. Listen to music? Check your emails, go on Facebook, go on Twitter, go on Instagram, do whatever you do with a smartphone. You know what is the most used function of a phone? It's the watch. It's the most used function of a smartphone. You take out your phone, you take a look at the time. It's quite interesting. Who of you is still using a watch, eh? Yeah, we're dinosaurs using that. Um, there was a really nice email from the former CEO of Nokia, Stephen Elip. I think it's two and a half years old by now. And he sent out this email to everybody at Nokia. And he said, the battle of devices has now become a battle of ecosystems. An ecosystem consists out of everything, hard and software. All the apps and the developers and everything. And then he closes this email. 
Our competitors aren't taking our market share with devices. They are taking our market share with an entire ecosystem. This means we're going to have to decide how we either build, catalyze, or join an ecosystem. You think of the latest move of Nokia, you know where they went from. These ecosystems we can find everywhere. And now I'm getting back to my first example, to the tourism example. Also there we have an ecosystem. Again, this is a very simplified example. We have our customers, we have the different stakeholders, like the travel agencies, like an airline, transportation, we have the hotel, and we have the restaurant, the diving school, the review platform, and then you can actually zoom into a hotel. If you think of like how many stakeholders are connected there, employees, different departments, suppliers, marketing, and all that. So it becomes a very complex system. And then you can try to understand what are the relationships between them. And you can actually visualize that, map it out. And I loved the, re uh, the presentation yesterday, which clearly showed the power, 10 minutes? That's Brazilian time, eh? I have to be quicker now. All right, let's talk about design. <laughs> so for me, service design is not new. Service, de service has been always designed, but designed by different departments. And it was like a hierarchical process. And most of the design was rather at the end. We were the guys who make it work, who make it look good. But in fact, if you think of who is involved into that, it's an interdisciplinary thing. We need all the people in there. And the role of a designer is changing. We're becoming facilitators of this process now, instead of working in our little offices. I wanted to give you a task, but I just have 10 more minutes, so I just skip that, forget this task. <laughs> so we are shaped like a T, right? We have a deep knowledge in a certain discipline and some broad knowledge across disciplines. And every discipline has its own language. We heard that yesterday. Uh, from loose talk. We call things completely different. Especially if we talk about a vague thing like a service, it's really hard to talk about the same thing if you do not talk the same language. So now I'm getting to what service design is for me, because actually for me, it is nothing more than a common language. It is not a new discipline. It is just a language which connects different disciplines and uses tools and methods of different disciplines. And the basis for that is an iterative design process. Very similar to what Josh talked about yesterday. Also lean or agile is based on the iterative design process. So it's not about planning things strictly through. It's about learning and doing and redoing that all the time. Fail early, fail safe, fail cheap. Do prototypes. In reality, it looks like this, really like that visualization because in the beginning it's pretty messy. Only if you really know what you were aiming for, then it's about working that out. But then you start again. So what I want to like to end with is what I call service design or however you call what we're doing, management. We have to start with an analysis of a customer journey. So we have to understand what is the whole customer journey. And now I'm getting back to um, my two roles, being a researcher and a professional. So I developed a tool, it's called My Service Fellow. It's an app for mobile ethnography. It was a research project I started in 2008, exactly due to the reason Dana told us before that, that the normal research didn't work for me. So what we do is we include customers as active researchers. It's nothing more than an online diary using a smartphone. So I'd like to show you a short video we use as an introduction for that. Do we have sound now? No? No sound? You're tired of those standard questionnaires that often ask the wrong questions. My Service Fellow is a free mobile app that allows you to give valuable feedback on the go by documenting your service experience at any moment you think is important. We call these moments touch points, and your life is full of them. Imagine you're going on a business trip. 
My service combo lets you easily document your flight experience. That meal tasted pretty bland. You can also document how you experience finding the hotel. Oh, that was easy. Taxi! Use your time in the queue to evaluate the check-in. Check-in took way too long. Did you find your room quickly? That was disappointing. Relaxing at the pool? <sighs> Give each touch point a title and evaluate how satisfied you are in total at that particular moment. Document each touch point with text, photos, videos, or voice memos and indicate all positive, neutral, or negative aspects by tapping on the smileys. Adding and evaluating touch points is done offline, preventing expensive roaming costs abroad. You can review and edit your evaluations at any time and upload all data at once after the service experience. Your data will then be analyzed and will give valuable insights for the improvement of the service. But my service fellow, you have a direct impact on the quality of a service. My service fellow, your experience matters. So this is a tutorial we show actually real customers. And we include them in our research. And normally what companies tell me, if I tell them, well, we need to understand first the whole customer journey. They say, that's not possible. That's way too expensive. It's not if we use new tools like that. And there are a whole bunch of new tools coming up. So the whole approach is called mobile ethnography. And the data you get out of that are emotional journeys. So exactly what I showed you. But you can go in depth there, because you have photos, you have videos, you have loads of text. And they do not only criticize, they give you ideas of how to make it better. We have GPS connected to that, so we can understand where people have positive experience and where people have negative experience. So once you know where to start in your whole customer journey, you need to zoom in. And normally, companies think, well, to have a big impact on customer satisfaction, I need to pay a lot of money. But this is not true. And if you map it out, or what we call a touchpoint portfolio, you will see that there are many ideas from customers which have a huge impact on customer satisfaction, but low cost. And of course, that is where you start. Simple things. Well, we have a little bit of time later, I can tell you a few examples for that. So you just map it out and say, let's start here. And then you start prototyping it. This is where we have loads of small iteration, creation, reflection. Prototyping of services means we really build them. We build them with pen and paper, with cardboard. We use a lot of improv theater techniques. And we go out into the wild and not only observe their customers in their natural habitat, we actually interact with them. So we show them a prototype and tell them, hey, what do you think about that? And get feedback for that. One of the largest hotel brands, Hyatt, is doing that now in nine hotels all over the world. They're using prototyping techniques very, very early. So just a cardboard prototype of a new check-in, they place it in the hotel and they test it. And they get reviews for that. I think that is great. The problem is, we have customer journeys, we work a lot with post-its in our workshop, and it is a big mess. So how do you communicate that? We used to do it with classic tools like InDesign or PowerPoint to create actual nicely visualized customer journeys. And that was where another research project started. And this is called Smaply. Smaply will hopefully launch next month. It is kind of the PowerPoint for service design. It's a tool where you can actually do personas, do customer journey maps, do stakeholder maps, plot it out, but also where you can work collaboratively in teams. So we turn the static tool of a customer journey into a dynamic tool where you can review and go back to and where you can change it and see how it affects it. I have to hurry up a bit. So I had a video for that, but I'm going to just skip that. It's easy to implement once you have a really good prototype, because it's an iterative process forwards. Yes, I'm going to go five minutes over time. I'm German. It hurts for me as well. Don't worry. 
Is it, is it okay for you if I go five minutes over time? <laughs> There you go. <laughs> so once you have a really good prototype, it's much easier to implement because you have tested it thoroughly and you know what, if it's going to work or not. How many prototypes do you do for a car before you launch it? How many prototypes do you do for a service before you launch it? Think about that. Yet, not so many, and that's why we're changing this right now. So I want to close my talk with a few examples of how we actually do it. This is Service Design Thinking, is the name we gave our book, and this is now the doing behind that. So which tools do we use? We do self-exploration, so we try the service ourselves, but not only as a designer, We also get the people working in an organization to eat their own dog food. Have you ever thought about a CEO of a company who runs through their own process on both sides, as a customer and an employee? It's mostly a pretty mind-breaking moment for them. We use a lot of ethnography tools, like participant observation. So we are there when things happen went to doctors to observe how this works in a hospital. And we did contextual interviews. So in that moment when something happened, we asked them, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this right now? By the way, this is Arne in the background. Of course, he's too tall to fit in the photo. That's a classic problem of you, hey? <laughs> Don't worry, I'll be off stage soon. We use tools like mobile ethnography. We use personas, both data-driven personas, so where we do research first, but also assumption personas, where we get real customers in the room and try to describe it themselves. Customer journey mapping. This is how it looks in reality when we work. We can't work digital. It doesn't work. We need to work with pen and paper in co-creative workshops. And then the results are pretty messy, and that's why we need tools like Snaply to quickly visualize that. So at the end of the workshop, we have a good visualization for that, and people can take it with them. We use stakeholder maps. These are pictures from a workshop we did for the United Nations. And you can see how messy it gets. And to really visualize that, we need tools. Value network map. So we try to understand what are the relationships between different stakeholders. We prototype services. This was a project in tourism where we actually planned a new building. So I've been working with architects there. And we put the plans on the table and we use Lego to understand if that really works. It didn't, which was interesting because they have been working for one and a half years on that. It just took us half an hour to understand that their ID just didn't match reality if you think in terms of a customer journey. We use service advertisement. This was a workshop with the Australian government, and they had the task to do in five minutes only. I'm German, I like to give strict deadlines, but I never stick to that, as you can see. If you do an advertisement for a public service, try to do an advertisement to sell your taxation service. That's quite interesting, and it changed the perspective. You can't design a service without thinking of the business model. So, of course, we use tools like the business model canvas to quickly sketch out what is the business model. How much money does this cost if we change it? How much revenue do we get from that? And it also helps to include those people into the process which are normally left behind, like accountants. Very important, controllers. And the last tool, we use theatrical tools, improv theater stuff. These are the two colleagues from me from Germany called Workplay Experience. Um, and they are professional actors. And they act out service situations. On the one hand, to understand them, so with real customers, with real employees, but then also to very quickly iterate. So you get new ideas in, in not days or hours, but minutes and seconds. So you can test new ideas on the spot. And this is more or less service design in a nutshell from me. There's some reading 
don't know if you can read that. There's a few good books about that. Um, but I'm going to put the slides on SlideShare in a few minutes, so you don't need to take photos of that. You can actually download it. Should have said that in the beginning, eh? Sorry for that. I just love to see your phones. Right. This.